Texas sends in Ditto's Rush. This is good. Listen to this. Listen up. Let me tell you. Let me tell you my whole plan. When I listen to the radio, Rush Limbaugh, he's the man. Rush who? Limbaugh, the greatest in the land. No other talk show host can do it like he can. Documented, almost always right. Rush Limbaugh knows it all. If you really want to know what's going on, just give the man a call. Updates on Gorby, New Age, the feminist mob. And there's a gaze and the homeless. Yo, man, get a job. There you have it. That's uh, Ditto's Rush. That's uh, Doug Rice out of Dallas. That is it infectious. I mean, that grows on you, my friends. Well, let's see. What is in the news here that we can... Uh, let's do our homeless update, ki uh, uh, Kiki. The trumpet fanfare, once again, signals it's time for an update for those of you new to the program. The homeless update, ladies and gentlemen, comes to us, in fact, from the nation's capital... Washington, D.C. Pops was an elderly homeless man who did not have a decent place to sleep, did not even have a decent place to die, did not have a decent place where to assume room temperature. On Christmas Eve, five years ago, Pops froze to death at a northeast bus stop. In death, however, Pops has found a niche. Pops is in a box on a bookcase in Mitch Snyder's old bedroom. My friends, our homeless update today is about what they've done at Mitch Snyder's Committee for Creative Nonviolence, otherwise known as the nation's number one homeless shelter. Mitch Snyder, who recently assumed room temperature by self-induced hanging. For those of you in Rio Linda, California, that means he committed suicide. He then left orders to be cremated, which he was, and his ashes now re reside in a box being carried around by his former girlfriend, Carol Fenley, who is pictured here sitting on the bed petting Mitch's cat while gazing longingly at the urn holding Mitch's ashes. And then there is another picture accompanying the story. The caption to the picture is, At the Committee for Creative Nonviolence, a bookshelf sits under a collection of photos of the late Mitch Snyder. In the boxes at right are the cremated remains of homeless people. I am not kidding you. I am looking. Have you ever gone to a store where they sell rocks, different kinds of pebbles and rocks and things, and pull out plastic little drawers? that are about three to four inches wide. That's exactly what this looks like. The Committee for Creative Nonviolence has turned into a morgue. The whole thing is about dying with dignity. And they're following Mitch's lead. They are becoming cremated, and they say this is how they finally find dignity in life. Now, I must take a moment to explain something, folks, because I realize that if you just hear me say this, Wow, Russia's really being hard on these people. Why these people have just died and he's been doing a homeless update, making fun of them? No. No, you see, my friends, I think the homeless advocacy is built upon fraud. 
is built on a major lie, that is, how many are homeless. Mitch Snyder and his band of activists always said three million. One day, Mitch even said 45 homeless die every minute. Run the numbers, you get 26 million. The bottom line is there was never any truth to the numbers, whichever numbers they use. The truth is that Mitch Snyder and the homeless advocacy in this country, and it can be documented, are not primarily trying to solve the problem, but instead seizing an opportunity of the unfortunate situation the homeless people are in so as to empower themselves. See, look at how unfair the 80s were. Look at how unfair Reagan budget policies were. Look at what housing cuts did. This proves capitalism doesn't work. And the homeless update, ladies and gentlemen, is designed to illustrate the misguided efforts and the fraud that exists within the movement. And to further the point, why run a story? Why get a story? Why seek coverage of how you deal with dead homeless people? So you cremate them. So you put them in plastic drawers. So you got 29 urns, in essence, of homeless people. What's that got to do with anything? The point they're trying to make is, see, this is how uncaring America is. This is how insensitive America is. These people are dying. Look at them. We can show you their ashes, right? This is nothing but exploitation of the homeless folks, designed to make you feel guilty, designed to attack the great systems of America which allow the greatest prosperity in the world. And the purpose of the Homeless Update is anytime I find fraud, anytime I find misguided attempts at gaining sympathy, which is irrelevant. Same color. I just noticed this. I want you to do me. Really, there's difference. Like rocks are different shades of gray. These ashes are different shades of... There are actually some... Now they'll call me a racist if I point that out. Never mind. I ain't got no... It's the Excellence in Broadcasting Network. A quick call before the break. This is Gene in New York City. Hi, glad you hey, called. Rush, how are you? Fine, thanks. Okay, I watched Nightline last night. Mm-hmm. Uh, same thing happened as when you were on. Ted Koppel went with the questioning in his own direction, okay? Mm-hmm. He did not allow the guy who was pretty much in opposition or had a different viewpoint. Frank talk. Gaffney, Frank Gaffney. Yes. Who I know, I've met him. Okay, I think that Saddam Hussein thinks he's Geppetto. The carpenter, and I think he thinks he's making a puppet, and Congress is Pinocchio. Yeah, but hold it a minute. What did you think of Biden? Oh, Biden, I was, like, uh, amazed, because, I mean, this is the same guy who was giving Judge Souter a hard time, you know, over vacillation on slight points in opinion change. This guy's done a... a, a a hundred percent turnaround. He's done a one eighty in one day. The minute he hears that Saddam Hussein, <coughs> it thinks Congress is his best friend. Joe Biden last night was talking like a bigger hawk than I've heard Bush speak. Well, you know, but here's another thing. I I heard. I don't know where I heard it. It was on the radio a couple of weeks ago, a month ago maybe. Mm-hmm. They had G. Gordon Liddy on some radio show. Okay, at night, and his phrase, which they kept trying to cut off, was that: "Listen, people, we must keep in mind." Hussein must not benefit. Material assets must not be left in place in Iraq. He must not benefit from the situation in Kuwait. And it's up to all your listeners. Okay, you're doing your job. We're not doing our job. We've got to call our congressman. I called my congressman before I called you. And I, and I made known my opinion. And I asked her, the person to read back what I had said. And I'm telling you, if everybody out there starts calling Congress, Joe Biden will look like a guy on a pinwheel because there'll be so many people doing flip-flops out there. And I need to ask you what you think we should, you know, how should we speak up? We've got to speak up. I don't, I don't, I, no, I disagree. I don't think you have to speak. Well, you call your congressman if you want, by all means, but I don't, I, I, I think... The, the only thing that frightens me is that the Bush administration may not realize here what a major victory they have just won. They may not, therefore, know how to play this. They just got the hostages back without firing a shot. And they've got Hussein on the run. And if they stick to it, they can get everything else out of him they want because the main reason he's doing any of this is because he wants to live. He knows the objective is to eliminate him. We'll be back.
following program contains mature subject matter that is definitely suitable for the art and croissant crowd, not to mention leftist pinko commies. Even feminazis are welcome, humaniacs, psycho babblers, environmentalist wackos, pencil neck geeks, and especially welcome members of the now crowd. And now, ladies and gentlemen, once again, Rush Limbaugh. And greetings to you, conversationalists. How are you, Rush Limbaugh? And the Excellence in Broadcasting Network kicking off yet another excursion. So happy you've joined us. It's a program exclusively tailored to rich Republicans and right-minded conservatives, liberals, Democrats, feminazis, and all that listen at their own risk, but we invite them to and we welcome them aboard. Hand me that. I really need this today. You know, folks, I'm coming down with another sore throat. Yesterday when I left the EIB building, just in the right side of the throat, a small little tickle. Get home last night and this thing becomes major source of pain. Now, I'm tough. I handle pain well. Now, this thing last night, I was afraid to swallow it got so bad. So I loaded up on antihistamines. And you know what antihistamines do? They kind of make you groggy. And so I'm sitting here once again, ladies and gentlemen. I am... You people really have, have, have no idea to what lengths I go to see to it that I show up. I know how much the nation needs me. I know how much the nation desires me. And I know how much the nation gets depressed when I'm not here. Most people in my condition today would have chucked it. Just stayed home, called in sick, and gone to a movie. But not me. I'm here because I realize my importance. But when you have to take drugs to try to ward off illness and makes you groggy, it makes your performance subject to deterioration. And so, to avoid that, I will now pour the official drink of the EIB building, Snapple Diet Iced Tea. Ooh, look at that, some of the... Just a drop. Just a drop. Missed my aims off because of the drugs. How could I have missed the glass? I'm two inches away from it. Ah, there you go. Okay, I know a lot of people are wondering what happened with Aziz and with Baker today. And the fact of the matter is that we don't know yet. The latest is that they have broken up after more than four hours of conversation. No clear signs, however, that this meeting would prompt a diplomatic solution to the crisis. Baker and Aziz sat down at 11 o'clock this morning, 5 a.m. Eastern Time, and broke for lunch at 1.16. They resumed at 2.28, and the second round broke up at 4.53 local time in Geneva with no word on whether they would resume. Baker called the president during lunch to give his description of events. The talks were substantive. According to Marlon Fitzwater, presidential spokesman, he would not characterize the atmosphere nor detail any of the other occurrences or words which exchanged places during the meeting. So we'll just have to wait and see on this. Um, interesting thoughts that people are, are now starting to uh, come forth with. As you know, the French have, in essence, said, no matter what happens in there, if it doesn't work, we're moving in. And we're going to try a diplomatic solution of our own. Hosni Mubarak of uh, Egypt has said that Israel will not become involved even if Israel is attacked. And that if Israel involves itself, should some fighting break out, that that'd be the end of the coalition, at least as far as Egypt is concerned, their membership in it. So uh, everybody's wondering now, what, what, what's next, what's next, what's next? I, I uh, still have, I must tell you, still have positive vibrations, little psychobabble lingo there over the uh, ultimate end to this thing. I, 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 see, here's, here's the thing. You, you people, a lot of people always become confounded. The media, you, you heard up until this meeting began early this morning, you heard that they were going to go in there and Baker's going to go in there and deliver the ultimatum, which I'm sure he did, but, but at the same time that this is uh, going to be a short and sweet meeting and that it wouldn't last more than 30 minutes and that uh, one side would come storming out, protesting the other side's attitudes. And everybody expected that. 
And here's a good sign, folks. Everybody in the media expected this thing to go as I just described it. Short, brusque, one side coming out angry. Everybody was expecting it. And look, it goes over four hours. And I would suggest to you that while everybody in the world and everybody in the media is sitting here talking war, 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 uh, that um, quite the opposite is, 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 is being worked out. I think everybody is trying very hard for that. Although Evans and Novak have an interesting column today. I'm, it might have appeared yesterday in your newspaper. I read it today. Uh, apparently Bush is reading a book by a former Republican who joined the Roosevelt administration, a man named Stimson. And uh, he uh, has a lot in common with Bush. Bush feels they have a lot in common. Both are members of the Skull and Bones Club at Yale. Uh, both uh, uh, have, have uh, the aristocratic background. And apparently, uh, the book's influence on Bush, according to unnamed aides, and remember now, Evans and Novak, no matter what you think, it's an opinion column. A lot of people read Evans and Novak and think, ooh, wow, that's imp powerful stuff, but Evans and Novak's an opinion piece. Never forget that. They just have a unique way of writing it as, as though it's, it's fact. Uh, they use sources, in these cases unnamed, and they, the whole point of the column was to say that this book is what's primarily motivating Bush toward war, that he thinks it's his destiny. Uh, that, that his claim to fame, that his, his, um, his legacy to mankind will be the defeat of Saddam Hussein. And some staffers are worried that no matter what happens, Bush is going to launch an attack because this book is having such a great influence. There's all kinds of speculation out there as to just what's going to happen. And nobody really knows, not even the principles in this thing. Um... I would still like to call your attention to the possibility of a regional settlement in this, in this crisis, that being a solution that appears on the surface, for all practical appearances, to have been structured by Arabs. Arabs getting together, solving the problem. Whether indeed it happens that way or not, I think it'll be portrayed that way, because I think in, in that scenario lies the face-saving that uh, both sides apparently are uh, going to need. In the meantime, the president has formally asked Congress to support the use of force. This is a smart political move because this is going to force the Congress into action. This is, in effect, going to get them on the record whether they vote or not. Because up till now, the, the Congress, and I, I, Democrats primarily, but Republicans as well, have um, have wanted uh, both ways on this. They, they've, they've assumed a posture that allows them to say that they did the right thing no matter what happens. Victory or defeat. War or no war. Now with the president saying, help me, come with me, support me, if they say no, then that clearly takes away one of the options that Congress has of saying we didn't stand in his way. The... Um, Chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, Les Aspen, front page of the New York Times story today, but it was public yesterday, says that we can win this thing uh, with fewer than 1,000 troops killed, with the emphasis being on airstrikes. He said that um, if all else fails, war is a reasonable option here. And his scenario that he has um, concocted based upon public testimony before his committee and the Senate committee, it's commensurate with his or comparable to his, and private talks, is that the sole goal of the war would be to liberate Kuwait, to not invade Iraq or overthrow Saddam Hussein. He believes that would be the case here. He also believes it would be a phased campaign, stressing airstrikes against targets in Iraq and against Iraqi troops in or near Karup, uh, Kuwait, ground troops used in the final stage, War could be ended in several weeks, at most 3,000 to 5,000 U.S. casualties, including 500 to 1,000 dead. And Aspen also foresees an effort by Saddam Hussein to break up the Arab coalition against him by attacking Israel, and he thinks that would fail. Well, that's awfully optimistic. And it's, it's, it's about time, but it's curious that it is coming at this point in time, as opposed to, well, I guess it really isn't, because the, I think what has happened in the private roll call votes that they've taken the head counts in Congress, I think 
Uh, leaders in the House and Senate now both know that uh, should the president formally ask for a declaration of war, he'd get it. I think the votes are there. So now you're seeing Congress shift to that side in their public expression of individual opinions. And uh, that gives an idea of how wishy-washy they are, but at least now it appears. Not, not, not guaranteed. I mean, there's still some, still some uh, detractors out there. Uh, Congressman Kennedy, this, I don't know, is this Joe? I think it's Joseph Kennedy, uh, is going to introduce a bill that would uh, give sanctions a chance to work for a year before any military action takes place. That, of course, is not going to fly, but it's going to be introduced. Also, uh, folks, Speculation has now begun on, okay, suppose Hussein pulls out or begins a pullout or does whatever necessary to satisfy the world to the point that wall is not necessary. What then becomes of the sanctions? Do you keep them on? Or do you take them off? What do you do? What do you do? When you, at one point, that's it, at, one, at what point do you say the sanctions are over? That's going to become the next debate. This is, this is and, he, and he clearly uh, is, is going to push for that should there be no wall. Uh, by the way, wall is the way Sam Nunn, chairman of the Senate Foreign Affairs Committee, pronounces the word. There are other things to discuss on today's program. We have a condom update. We have a homeless update. We have uh, a gorbasm coming up on today's. What else did I tell you? And an animal rights update. Daycare babies get more colds. I've been telling you people this. We also, the big, you know, the, 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 the talk again that uh, the military is comprised of a disproportionate uh, share of a percentage of black soldiers. That issue is being raised again. A Bronx city councilman has now opined that uh, the date of January 15th as the deadline for Hussein is racist because it's Martin Luther King's birthday. Another heavy metal rock star has assumed room temperature. We don't know why. That's uh, Steve Clark from Def Leppard. And, uh, well, there's all kinds of fun stuff. Your calls, too, right after this. Say right where you are. W-A-B-C. A general Dinkins update. There's a holdup in the Bronx. Brooklyn's broken out in fights. There's a traffic jam in Harlem that's backed up to Jackson Heights. There's a scout to short a child. Cruz says to an idle wild. General David Dinkins, where are you? They said, elect the general. It'll be safer, nicer, sweeter, happier here. Maybe it is for some, those who've left. A woman... Ladies and gentlemen, while the healing of the city goes on, was pushed in front of a moving subway train yesterday for one dollar. Man wanted one dollar. She refused. They caught him. She died. The healing goes on. There's a holdup in the Bronx. Brooklyn's broken out in fights. There's a traffic jam in Harlem that's backed up to Jackson Heights. There's a scout troop short a child. Cruz says to an idle wild. General David Dinkins, where are you? And further irony, he didn't just ask for a dollar, wanted the whole wallet, grabbed the wallet. A dollar was all that was in there. She died for a dollar. But first offense... He'll be out, what, three years maybe? Because they don't have enough prisons or some such thing. To the phones we go to San Jose, California. This is Barry. Hello. Hello, Rush. Hi. Hi. Um, KNBR in San Francisco. The Giant 68, yes. Yes, it gave you a six-week report card on the Peter B. Collins So He had calls come in. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, he, he had earlier on uh, relegated you to the fringe hour. Good afternoon, everyone. 25 minutes after 12 on WABC. This is Harley Carnes from the WABC Newsroom, and we have Carol Zimmer on the line now. We do have sentencing in the Central Park jogger assault case. Carol, tell us about it. Well, Harley Kevin Richardson got three and a third to ten years in prison for his role in the assault on the female jogger. Kerry Wise got five to fifteen years for his role. Uh, Judge Galligan decided that Wise's sentence would run concurrently because even though he was over the age of sixteen at the time of the assault, Galligan felt that his age was close enough to the minors involved in the assault that he shouldn't get a sentence that was totally out of line with the other youth. 
votes. So, as I said before, Kevin Richardson got three and a third to ten years for his part in the assault, Kerry Wise, five to fifteen years. After Judge Galligan announced the sentence, uh, one of the rows of supporters erupted. People got up. They started yelling, freedom or death. Judge Galligan uh, told the court officers to take one of those people into custody, and one of those people was arrested. You take that to be a threat against the judge? Well, it's hard to say. Uh, there was uh, someone else holding up the sign that said, we know where you live. So oh, really? it's hard to say whether they were threatening the judge or the prosecutor, uh, but there's definitely a lot of anger from the supporters of these youths in the courtroom today. Hmm. Okay, thanks a lot. WABC's Carol Zimmer will be getting more from her reaction and so forth as the afternoon goes on. 26 after 12, I'm Harley Carnes, and now back to Rush Limbaugh. Bring them in. There's a redemption center. Some place on the west side, like on the west side highway or on, on 11th, 10th Avenue, somewhere over there, and uh, showed this guy, I am not kidding, with one shopping cart, must have had 25 huge trash bags. I mean, uh, these Yeah, they are, make the rounds of the dumpster. Right, now, the, but the, I'm not talking kitchen, I'm talking about outdoor, these are the 35 or 40 gallon trash bags. This guy had 12 or 13 of them, like in a net. And the net, it was like they were in a hot air balloon. They were the hot air balloon, and, and, and the gondola was, was the shopping cart. Mm -hmm. And this guy came trooping in. He makes 400 bucks a day. Yeah, I know. Doing it. And he's not homeless. No. The other people that you see, this wasn't my main point anyway, but the other people you see are also farmers or ranchers, whether they have pigs and stuff. Yeah. And they dig through there for cheap feed. Yeah. All the uh, grocery store dumpsters. At any rate, well, any, what I was, uh, wanted to get to was I saw a assumed homeless person in my travels with a little card that said we'll work for food so being a caring person though i'm not liberal i decided to i got a whole truck full of bread so i thought well i'll give him a couple of loaves of bread so i pulled up and i said um here you go and he goes uh do you have any twinkies or anything like that and well I go, no i don't carry those and he says oh well thanks anyway so this struck me kind of odd if you're starving wouldn't you just take whatever you were given, and then I started noticing more of these guys cropping up. I traveled uh, long distances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See some more of them with these will work for food, and I'm in an affluent area that I serve. And I, it, it finally occurred to me, they don't want food. They want money. Who in their right mind would take them to their homes and give them yard work and stuff? Well, you can, you can run tests. I mean, people have. When I was in Sacramento, we did this. You go out and offer them, if, 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 take them into a coffee shop and get them a cup of coffee and a hamburger. They don't want that. Uh, they do want the money. I'll tell you why, though. This is a, another good point. Uh, people say that I unfairly bash the homeless, and I don't. What I do is is uh, try to inform you about what really is behind the homeless movement, not only politically but socially. And in, in the case of, like, you drive a bread truck, and a homeless guy with a sign says, we'll work for food, and you offer him a couple of loaves of bread... And he says, no, I'd rather have a, a, a couple of Twinkies. There is an example of somebody not really going hungry. And the, the idea that there are people on the streets starving in this country is another myth that is being uh, promoted so as to convince more and more people, or at least as many as possible, that the U.S. system just really doesn't work. And how can you have such affluence and such poverty with people starving? And they're really not starving. A homeless man in New York told about how you can go 15 different places for a steaming hot meal every day in New York City. There's no reason, if you're homeless, to be starving. And most of them are not. We will be back. Hello, sir. How are you doing? I'm fine. I'm a liberal Democrat member of the Air Force. And uh, I used to disagree with about 95% of what you said. Now it's about 75%. I don't know what that means. We're, we're, it, it, I'll tell you what it means. It means you're slowly but surely being converted and you don't even know it. Oh, okay. Well, well, I wouldn't hold my breath, but it's a, it's a good sign. You have a good program. Thank you. My, uh, I have a few points, but I, I know how time is valuable. No, I just no, no. Go, ahead, go ahead. Interesting call. We stay with it. Okay. Well, uh, first of all, um, back at the time, early days of Vietnam, George Kennan said, uh, develop the list of about four or five re uh, criteria that should be used when determining whether U.S. force should be used to support a nation. Mm -hmm. Perhaps the most important one was, gonna, was uh, will the use of U.S. force accomplish the goals that we've got in mind? Interesting letter, email on CompuServe yesterday from some guy who had heard my conversation with Sherry Warren, who is the info babe television reporter in Shreveport, Louisiana, who found herself enmeshed 
in a minor controversy when in New Orleans on December 16th, in the locker room of the Pittsburgh Steelers, there stood quarterback Bubby Brister, clad only in a towel. She's interviewing him in the postgame uh, interviews. And at the end of the interview, hugged him. <gasps> Violating the sacred principles of journalism. <gasps> Objectivity, disinterest, dispassion. <gasps> there she hugged him and some even said, kissed him. She denies that. She called this show yesterday to set the record straight. She's a regular listener to the program. And one of the exchanges that took place, now this is a good point, too. One of the exchanges that took place between a QB, Bubby Brister, and an info babe, Sherry Warren, she asked him, what do you want for Christmas? This is in the post-game interview. All the reporters are on. What do you want for Christmas? He said, well, I'd like to keep on winning. We just want to keep on winning. And uh, maybe I'd like you. And she said, well, you can have me for a while. And everybody laughed. The feminist movement and several uptight northerners thought that that was very unprofessional behavior. But a guy from the South wrote and said, isn't it refreshing? And isn't it interesting that it was a southern woman who had the presence of mind to throw the answer to the question back in a kidding manner, the same way it was offered. In other words, she didn't go out and get terribly offended and file a sex discrimination suit and act like she had just been wronged for the rest of her life. She took it in the good humor in which it was intended. She had the ability to laugh about it. She's not uptight, unable, incapable of laughing at herself. And I said, that's a good point. That's a good point. I knew I liked her. I knew I liked her, and that is one of the reasons, because she got involved. Can you imagine an uptight, ultra-feminazi and what do you want for Christmas, Mr. Brister? Well, I'd like you for a while. Oh, yeah? Well, I'll get you. I'm going to get you thrown out of the National Football League. That's a sexual harassment suit. You can be prepared to pay me a million bucks, pal. That's how most northern feminazis would have dealt with it. Also, more feminist news. Mary Beale, who is the owner and the operations director and, and the do-it-all at our Wichita affiliate, KNSS, faxed me yesterday with some revealing news. It, because a guy called me yesterday and said that, Rush, you're, you're not consistent. You, on one hand, will, will tell us to listen to you and say and accept everything you say just because of you saying it. You got mad because some woman wanted to know where you heard that FDR purposely allowed the Japanese to attack Pearl Harbor. And I said, Madam, is it not enough that I say it? As I've always said, you don't need to read the papers, you don't need to do it anymore, I'll do it for you, plus I'll tell you what to think. And his analogy example was, look at these scientists who said that uh, eating red meat causes colon cancer. You say distrust science. You say, but what is your fact in it? And I said, my experience with science. One day they tell us oat bran muffins are great for lowering cholesterol. Two years later they say it doesn't mean beans. One day they say the great big bang theory is intact. The next day they say, whoops, major flaw, got to go back to the drawing board. Well, the, um, the facts that I received is a, is a news release from a dietician for the Kansas Beef Council. Her name is Diana Elias. She's a woman. I make that point only because I'm going to laud her and give her credit for telling the truth which will confound those you, of you who think that I am sexist, chauvinistic, and all that. See, the beef industry is very much distressed when science puts out these stories that 88,000 women in a test group developed colon cancer and let it go at that, because they know that people are going to read that and go, ha, 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 and stop eating beef and stop buying it, and the beef industry suffers. And we know that vegetarians are now becoming militant and they are defining ethics and morality by what you eat. You're immoral and you have no ethics if you eat beef. And we know that militant vegetarian groups are trying to shut the beef industry down. If you don't believe that, I'll be glad to prove it to you. But I haven't time in this break. You just have to accept my word for it. Well, the Kansas Beef Council and their staff dietitian, Diana Ellis, has put out this press release, which says in part... A closer look at that study showed that only one-tenth of one percent of the 88,000 women who were diagnosed with colon cancer, only one-tenth of one percent of the 88,000 women were diagnosed with, the, they all didn't get it. 
which was one of the impressions left by the sketchy reporting done, that every one of them got it, or that 40% did, or a high percentage. One-tenth of one percent of the 88,000 women were diagnosed. She also said that other risk factors, such as smoking, the amount of exercise and job stress have to be taken into consideration in addition to diet, and they weren't. In her words, it seems to be an extremely small figure to be making such a dramatic connection. The American Cancer Society and the Kansas chapter of it say that lean beef can be included in a diet aimed at preventing the disease. So, you know, I just, folks, what I do on this show, if you haven't figured out, I identify extremism and blow it away. And uh, so much of science has, has become politicized and uh, contaminated, if you will, with with extremism. So thanks, Mary, for sending me this. I'm glad to have it. Share it with the people of America. Back with more in just a moment. <music> Telephone number 1-800-282-2882 if you want to be part of the Excellence in Broadcasting Network. Here is Sherry Cicero, Indiana. This is where Ryan White's from. Hello. Hi. How are you? I'm fine. Uh, I heard you lamenting the other day on the telephone about how females never call your show. Well, I have tried to call many, many times since uh, WNDE began carrying you. Mm -hmm. I began listening shortly after that, and it's just, um, it takes a lot of effort for me to be able to sit on the phone. I am a stay-at-home mother with yeah. four young children, yeah. and to sit here and wait. Uh, while I've been on the phone, my Culligan man came. And I had to talk to him. I yeah. had to put my dog out because he was having a little fit. Yes. My three-year-old, I had to park him in front of the TV watching Sesame Street. Yes. Which I hate doing. Why? Well. You don't because, like Sesame Street? Well, no. I think Sesame Street is fine. I just don't like using it as a babysitter. Oh, I see. Okay. I usually try to sit with him while he's watching it or at least be in the kitchen with him. He's downstairs in the den. I'm upstairs with the door shut in my bedroom. I see. Because he was screaming at me wanting things, you know, come down here, Mom, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it just it takes a lot of effort and a lot of... Well, you know, men, they always want women to wait on them. I know it. Uh, I know <laughs> Well, this is good. This is instructive. So you were... And I, I, to refresh people's memory, I was lamenting the fact that, that women don't call a show like this as frequently as, as they call other talk shows with, with like, the topic being dating... Oh, no, no, or with no. the topic being a psychiatrist, or the topic being uh, love and romance, or psychics. That kind of, I mean, you'll hear women, a cooking show, you'll hear women call 50, 15 times in a row. But in an issue show, they don't. And you say it's because you have to sit on hold for so long while you're out there having to do other things around the house. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm at home. I bake my own bread. I make pie crust from scratch. In fact, well, Bo caught me so off guard, I was rearranging cookbooks. When he answered the phone. Rearranging cookbooks. Yeah. You are placing rearranging cookbooks above being on this show well, as I a priority? In, I was just in shock. So many times I call and get a busy signal. Yeah. And when the phone actually started to ring and then when he answered, I yeah. thought, oh my goodness, it's... I obviously dialed the wrong number. I, <laughs> I couldn't possibly have gotten through. By the way, it's Mervyn Snerdley that's here today. Bo Snerdley oh. is... Bo did something very strange. I'm told that Bo uh, wrenched his back last night in bed. I will speculate no further on this, but um, he is not here, and so Mervyn Snerdley is in. Well, maybe maybe uh, we ought to try an experiment, Merv. Maybe every time we get a woman caller, we'll put her at the front of the line so she doesn't have to wait. Obviously, women are busier than men in today's society, and maybe we'll try that for an hour and see if it helps. Stay with us, folks. We'll be back. The following program has been pre-recorded for broadcast at this time on WABC New York. Remember, this program was pre-recorded, so please do not attempt to call our regular phone numbers, the 800 numbers, or the 900 poll numbers at this time. The following program contains mature subject matter that is definitely suitable for the art and croissant crowd, not to mention leftist pinko commies. Even feminazis are welcome, humaniacs, psychobabblers, environmentalist wackos, pencil neck geeks, and especially welcome members of the now crowd. And now, ladies and gentlemen, once again, Rush Limbaugh. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Rush Limbaugh program. A daily excursion into broadcast excellence. 
phone number if you want to be part of the show today is 1-800-282-2882. The um, programming reminder is that we are going to tape Friday's pro uh, program this afternoon on Thursday between 3 and 6 Eastern Time. Make a note, you can call between 3 and 6 Eastern Time if you get through. We'll place you on hold, and you will be able to hear what's going on prior to your going on. And you'll know, therefore, what to speak about. But it doesn't matter because the Friday version of this show is a version in which the callers choose the topics anyway. So, where now do we begin? Where do we go now? I think, um, wh I would like to first start, obviously we have to discuss the situation in the Gulf and the massive pessimism that is sweeping over the country. The congressional debate will begin soon. I'm going to make a prediction to you about that. But it really doesn't matter what happens in the congressional debate as far as President Bush's ultimate action is concerned. He'll do what he wants to do because legally, and this is the, this is the thing to remember, legally, ladies and gentlemen, he doesn't need the authorization from Congress to make a military move. He does not need a declaration of war, nor does he need an authorization of the um, UN resolution which guarantees or authorizes the use of force. He doesn't need it, and it's not anything to do with the U.S. Constitution. It has to do with a United Nations resolution, which uh, dates back to 1950 and the Truman administration, in which and I forget the name of it, it's something called the, uh, it might be the United States Participation Act, or the United States Participation Resolution, and it authorizes the United States, the President, it authorizes the President of the United States to commit U.S. troops on behalf of a United Nations maneuver, which this is, this is a United Nations maneuver. Remember now, we go back in time, and I could recall for you my saying, the world is behind George Bush, where is the U.S. Congress? It's the only institution which is not on board. Hasn't been on board for a long time. Now, I'm going to address a sensitive issue, a little bit of a sensitive issue. This program tomorrow will be on tape. And as a result, this program tomorrow will be taped prior to the outcome of the congressional debate unless we know during the program that we taped this afternoon what the outcome is. Which is why I'm telling you at the outset here that it doesn't really matter what the congressional debate is as far as uh, President Bush is concerned and as far as him taking military action if he chooses to. It is a fascinating topic, don't misunderstand, a, an engrossing topic to discuss and it would be fun and we can do it all we want but I'm telling you uh, that it, it isn't going to matter what they do. They're coming to the party a day late and a dollar short, as far as I and a lot of other people are concerned. And I would like to uh, state and go on record right now as saying that if there are those of you who believe, and I frankly don't, but if there are those of you who believe, and, and the president says he believes this, and I'm, I'm, I don't, but he says he believes that Sodom just hasn't gotten the message yet. And he's sitting over there and thinks we're bluffing, just hasn't, doesn't, doesn't take all this seriously. I, I don't think he's that stupid. I think he probably does take it very seriously. I just think he's not uh, a quick uh, study in, in, in caving in. But that's even a matter of opinion as well. The, the thing, though, that if you believe he is not quite convinced, then you also have to admit why. One of the great reasons why would be the divisiveness that has appeared to result from the open display of our democratic process. And I don't decry our democratic process, and I don't criticize the openness of it. I think there are aspects of it, Senate hearings and so forth, House hearings, it could be done behind closed doors, but it's irrelevant. Simple fact of the matter is that Hussein, who does not understand the democratic process, can look at CNN and C-SPAN and watch it play out before his eyes, and misconstrue what it means. Or does he misconstrue what it means? Are there true divisions of intent, or is politics being played out? I happened to note on television last night that Senator Bob Dole said in different words something I have been proffering here on this program for six weeks or longer. 
Dole said, it appears that there are Democrats in Congress who are more interested in getting Bush out of the White House than Hussein out of Kuwait. Well, that's a glib way of stating it, and the reporter who was interviewing the president, or the senator, Senator Dole, thought that was just a horrible thing to say, horrible thing to say. But I firmly believe it true. I think that much of the motivation that has come from the Democratic leadership in Congress has been motivated by the attempt and the desire to thwart this presidency rather than to be statesmanlike. I've said it, so this is nothing new. Hussein, watching this from afar, could easily, if he's uh, not well-rooted in the democratic process and how democratic institutions function, could well construe that what we have here is a major divisiveness, a major division in our country as to who can do what. And he may believe that the president really won't and can't do anything until Congress says so. And right now, Congress is trying to occupy both positions. But yesterday, the president made a brilliant political move, which has resulted in today's congressional debate. And I believe that the Congress is going to go for the authorization of the use of force. I think that ultimately, when the vote's taken, it may be split one way or down the other in the House and Senate. It may come out in different numbers, but... But I think basically Congress is going to give that authorization because the, uh, the uh, pessimism sweeping uh, Washington now is such that uh, it, it, it just would seem to fall into place that way. Also, I think that had Congress not uh, engaged in, in so much political posturing, in other words, had Hussein not seen the Congress do what it did, had Congress stepped up to the plate, gone on record one way or the other, rather than vacillating and trying to occupy both positions here at the same time, I think that uh, Hussein would, uh, if you believe that he doesn't really believe it, he would have believed that we're serious long ago had he not witnessed the divis divisiveness that is going on in our society. Now, Again, this is not a criticism of our society, and it's not, a desire, it's not an expression of a desire to change the way we do things. I just think you've got to factor in the fact somebody living in the part of the world that Hussein lives in, kind of government he runs, looking at an open democracy, and the practice of that democracy is not going to understand it, is going to seize on his perception of dissent. Uh, for example, what is his perception of dissent? Everybody is now going nuts angry over the fact that Tariq Aziz refused to accept the letter. True, a major rebuke, a major diplomatic rebuke. But also, my friends, keep one thing in mind. What happens to subordinates who bring Saddam Hussein bad news? They get shot. And uh, I, I think that's clearly a factor here. He doesn't want to hear bad news. And... I'm sure that Tariq Aziz wants to stay alive. Tariq Aziz is the only Christian in the Iraqi cabinet. Are you aware of that? He is not a Muslim. He is a Christian. He has no support system other than the goodwill of Saddam Hussein, my friends. He is a, um, a, a man kind of dangling all by himself, serves at the pleasure of Hussein, and if that pleasure should ever be rescinded and taken away, then there is no place for Aziz to go. So I, 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 I think that it's also important to remember uh, the, the various specifics of these things before we go drawing all kinds of negative major conclusions. Now I'd like to address some of the outlandish things I have heard so far today and read. There's a New York newspaper columnist who obviously is guilty of what many accuse those of us in talk radio being, and that is irresponsible, uninformed, liars, simply trying to stir passions for the purposes of quick ratings. The man's name is Mike McElary. His column today has as its major point the oil price, the fact that Baker yesterday in his press conference never once mentioned the word oil, yet that's what this is really all about. And it, look what happened. The oil price was down $3 for the day at the time Baker began his remarks. When Baker finished, the oil price was shooting back up. $5 a barrel it went up yesterday. McElary's point is that's what Baker and Bush want, the price of oil going back up. That they're willing to, and such phrases as Bush and Baker 
cannot wait to quench their thirst for blood. They're eager to do so. Pointed out that Baker took three glasses of water, three drinks of water during his press conference, and in only five more days he can quench his, uh, quench his thirst for blood. That kind of irresponsible accusation in a major city newspaper uh, clouds and, I think, discredits journalism as a whole. Then here's a column by Bob Herbert, who is a star columnist in New York City, writes for the New York Daily News, just been hired by NBC. He quotes a Harlem lady, his primary source, a Harlem lady, watching television, watching all this yesterday. The only reason we're going to war is testosterone. Uh, little boys grow up, and they like to shoot guns and so forth. And then when big boys get big, when they have armies at their control, they love shooting their toys and shooting their guns. If it weren't for testosterone, then none of this would be going on. Note, that's why women don't engage in these kinds of things. They don't have testosterone. So the longer this thing drags out, the more ridiculous... The accusations against those, would you want to be Bush in this situation? Would you want to be James Baker? Would you want to be in the Gulf? Would you want to be responsible for the decisions that are going to have to be made? I doubt that many of you would. And to, to, to give credence in a serious way, I mean, I can understand doing a joke prank column about some woman who thinks testosterone's a problem. Uh, or who, who thinks that uh, some, some column about the fact that, that, that Baker's now happy because the oil price is shooting back up and he may be invested in oil. Um, but that clearly is irresponsible given the, uh, the, the situation uh, that we now find ourselves in. However, folks, I, Rush Limbaugh, come to the rescue here because while there is massive paranoia, massive pessimism, massive negativism out there, I'm here to tell you that I think that what happened yesterday is not the end, but rather the beginning. Yesterday was the beginning of the end of this resolution, and I still believe that there is not going to be a wall. Still believe that. Uh, many people think that the situation yesterday, the, the six-hour meeting, broke down and, oh, no, oh, no, it's over, we're going to war. And I think it's just the beginning. We, uh, we shall soon see, at, uh, at any rate. Uh, note what the uh, Iraqis are trying to do Aziz never once mentioned Kuwait in his press conference when asked directly, will you invade Israel, will you attack Israel if, uh, if the war starts? Absolutely. Yes, we will, absolutely. What happens here is that uh, the Iraqis know that their really real hope here is to try to rally the Arab community to its side, uh, to, to his side, the Iraqi side, uh, which is not a situation which exists now, and Israel is the only way that can happen. There are people, though, who disagree. William Sapphire, a very powerful column in the New York Times today, who's convinced that it's all over. War is soon. And uh, the letter is the big key to it, the fact that they refuse to accept it. There's also a lot of other stuff out there that has nothing to do with this that we should discuss, too. So a lot on the table to talk about here. We'll get to all of it, plus your phone calls right after this. We'll save this for a Governor Cuomo update. Governor Cuomo did his State of the State address yesterday, blamed it all on Bush. A Governor Kubo update. It's our Governor Kubo update theme. Murray Head and the Trinidad Singers with our Governor Kumo update theme. Of course I know what this is implying. He's going to save everybody. He's better than Gorbachev. Every time I look at you, I don't understand Why you let the things you did get so out of hand You'd have managed better if you'd had it planned Why'd you choose such a backward time and such a strange land? If you'd come today, you would have been the foundation E.I.B. Rush Limbaugh Kumo 
Cuomo update, ladies and gentlemen. State of the state yesterday in New York. We're in trouble here in the state. Austerity like we have never seen it before. And guess whose fault it is? It is George Bush's fault. It is Ronald Reagan's fault because they are the ones responsible for the recession, which is responsible for the financial condition in which New York State finds itself. This, of course, is a bunch of baloney. This is, of course, a bunch of balderdash, a bunch of poppycock, a bunch of gobbledygook, a bunch of BS for those of you on the streets. The simple fact of the matter, well, I want to communicate. Simple fact of the matter is that the state of New York and the city of New York are in the straits they're in because of the liberal, democratic leadership that has gone unchallenged for year after year after year. If you want to know what happens when you get 100% liberalism without any checks or balances, then all you need to do is look at New York State, look at New York City, look at Washington, D.C. But, of course, it's Reagan's fault. It's Bush's fault. The Governor Cuomo had better be aware that he barely won his re-election bid while running against a joke. A serious candidate in opposition could have presented him a problem. Keep a sharp eye, folks. He now has his eyes on Washington. The Democrats salivating now at the opportunity to actually go in and measure the White House windows for drapes and linoleum for real this time because of the current situations in which we find ourselves. And about this recession, about the Pan Am reorganization filing for bankruptcy, before you people go off half-cocked out there and think that this is because of a failing economy, it is not because of a failing economy. The reason Pan Am had to file is because there is not a bank that will give them enough money in the form of a loan to keep going. And the reason for that is, is the federal government has clamped down on banks and the regulation of banks to such a degree that the banks are scared to death to loan any money. Because they're being compared with the way the savings and loans were run, and the banks are just sitting there basically doing nothing. They're afraid to make loans. They won't make loans. They're being regulated so tightly by the federal government now that we're in big trouble. But I'll tell you, they're going to have to lower the discount rate a lot more than they have. And they're going to have to, they're going to, have to deregulate some of this. I know that shocks. Deregulate? Rush, why? We're in a near fatal crisis. Not that at all. We're going to have to turn the banks loose and let the people who run the banks run the banks. But right now, the government's moving in there, and they've got the people running the banks scared to do anything. I'll give you a, Pan Am just one example. A good friend of mine who owns a restaurant, who has shown a profit every year, who has paid back his note every year on the button, has never been late, cannot get a dollar's worth of a new loan to expand his business. And he's got a perfect payment record. The banks have made millions off of my friend in the form of interest that he has paid back. The same bank would not loan him any more money simply because of tight regulation. He's having to get a little bit from this bank, a little bit from that. Big problem. Here's a man who wants to expand his business in this so-called recession. And because of the tight money policy and the over-regulation of the banks... He's having problems doing it. Boise, Idaho. Jim, hello. Welcome to the Rush Limbaugh program. Hi, Rush. How are you? Fine. Dan? Thank you. I'd just like to make uh, uh, my point about uh, the letter. Hmm? And I think that Bush should make public the content of that letter, don't you? Absolutely. I think you should do it on January the 15th. Right. Uh, here is Tariq Aziz saying the letter is rude and impolite. William Sapphire makes a brilliant point. The representative of the nation that reintroduced poison gas to modern warfare, used hostages as human shields, and is now systematically pillaging its Arab neighbor, this man was instructed to say the tone of the communication was not polite. Bush ought to release the contents of this letter so that the world will know just to what extent we went to try to forge a peace with this man. All right. And, and as far as the, the, you know, the gasoline and the prices like that, I think that they ought to let the gasoline go up to about five bucks a gallon we use less over here and if we use less we have a, you know it's like a boycott type of thing seems to work yeah well, uh, well see you can I don't think that we'll you will use less obviously that that great a price increase would cause a um, obviously a decrease in use uh, but that then see if you if you if you deshackle the market a decrease in use is is going to cause there to be an increase in supply.